This podcast is for informational purposes only and should not be considered legal, medical, or mental health advice. The views and opinions expressed by the host of My Brain is a Wonderland are exactly that. Views and opinions. This is Emily Ruth Henderson, and I'm the host of My Brain is a Wonderland, the podcast for neurodivergent women and the people who love them. In 2020, after a hellish pandemic, I was diagnosed with ADHD and autism. Surprise! Now, I am passionate about reaching other women just like me who've been pushed aside, ignored, and misdiagnosed for far too long. Every week, I discuss my experience navigating my 30s with these two life-changing diagnoses. There'll be highs, there'll be lows, and everything in between when you join me for Season 4 of My Brain is a Wonderland. Hello, everyone, and welcome back. I'm here, back in action. I didn't leave you alone for too long, I hope. I just wanted to start this episode by giving a little apology and a little explanation. You've probably noticed that I've been a bit scattered with my episodes and a little bit MIA, and really, it all just started... Well, I don't really know where it started. I do know that I scheduled the last episode, or the episode before, I can't remember now. And I scheduled it for like a week late or something, or at like the wrong time, and I didn't notice. And so it didn't go out when it was supposed to go out. Then when I noticed, I spiraled. I I like noticed a couple of weeks later, but I'd already dropped off and not done an episode for that week prior. Felt guilty. Had all these feelings. Didn't know if I wanted to drop this season. Didn't know if I wanted to come back. Didn't know what was going on. I'm still having a lot of issues at work, so that has been um, difficult to stay on top of. And um, my personal life is fine, but I'm just finding, I don't know about you guys, but I find it's difficult to have the energy sometimes when there's certain things going on, like you have a stress at work, your dog has cancer, all that kind of stuff. So thank you for being with me again. I want to close out um, that two-episode series I promised you today about being an undiagnosed autistic kid, and that is the plan. And then I hope to have a doggy episode ready for you either tomorrow or very soon. Just to give a quick update, he's doing great, um, as great as a dog can do who is dying from cancer. Sorry, gotta make jokes. If you don't laugh, you'll cry. So he's doing really well. He's responding well to the chemo, but I'll get into it a little bit more on the next episode about what we've been going through, what could happen, what might happen, what is happening. So thank you for being here. And don't forget, if you are feeling so inclined, you have some money, $1, $5, it doesn't matter. It all makes a difference. Please feel free to donate to my GoFundMe for my dog's chemo treatment. Uh, We're looking to be at around $6,000 in the hole this year, and I think I mentioned it on another episode, but we went through a hurricane, and we are having to pay to put our fence back up. We had to pay to have our roof repaired because we have a $6,000 deductible, so nothing was covered. And guess what? We are now tracking the path of another hurricane that may hit us directly as a Cat 3, and we may be evacuating again. So stay tuned for an episode about that, because, man, if you have anxiety, hurricanes are not for you. I used to live in California, and I lived in Oregon, and they always used to say, you know, like, a uh, an earthquake's fine, but a hurricane, oh my god. And I would say, well, at least with a hurricane, you get, like, a, you know, few days notice, you can evacuate, you can make plans, whereas an earthquake just hits. I don't know, man, now I'm kind of in the pool of, like, give me, give me an earthquake so I don't even know it's coming. Let me... Let me just sit here in bliss until I realize, you know, the world is falling down around me. I don't know. I'm not really sure what's worse. Why don't you guys who live on the West Coast and have anxiety, let me know. 
And just before we get started, I wanted to shout, give a shout out to two people who left fan mail for me. Uh, there was kind of a long one here, so I'm not going to do the whole thing. But someone from, it looks like California. I don't know how these post through. It looks like they came from the same person, but they're not. Anyway, it says, it's cool that you're being so thoughtful and considerate of other folks on the spectrum. But at the same time, I think many of us still appreciate your wit and humor uh, with how you've been doing your titles from the start. So it's referencing how I said that, you know, I was kind of doing punny titles, which I super loved, but it wasn't helping with my reach. It wasn't helping with my search. It wasn't helping with discoverability online because there was nothing in there to indicate what anything's about. So I thought I was being real cool and funny. And I, I was, you yeah, know, of course. But it didn't do anything for the growth of the podcast. I love the name My Brain is a Wonderland. It's actually based off um, My Body is a Wonderland, that song by John Mayer. And I cannot stand John Mayer. Sorry, guys. Sorry. Cannot stand him. But that song just was everywhere, you know, when it came out. And just that just came into my mind when I was thinking of the name of the podcast. But I wish now that I'd had actually just named it something like my ADHD life, my ADHD autistic life, you know, my experience with, just so it's easier for people like you to find um, help, really. And they close out that with saying, anyway, keep doing your thing. It's been an awesome journey listening to your life and insights. Cheers. So thank you. And then my second fan mail is, Emily, I'm so excited season four is on. Every week I look forward to your episodes. Sorry, I know it's not been every week lately. Regardless of what, how crappy my day is, you make me laugh and smile. When you announced that you reached 1,000 listens in just two weeks, I happy clapped a lot. Ugh, don't make me cry. Navigating the ad features could be quite an ordeal, but I'm glad you have access to a new revenue stream. So, or did I read about this already? Did I read this one already online? I'm not sure. If you guys have been following my ad um, situation as well, I am getting ads flowing through now. So basically they pop up. And I have to approve them that I want them in the podcast, but then they have to approve that they want to be on the podcast. And I don't think anyone's done that yet. I'm wondering if they're kind of going off the demographics I set. It's like mostly women, 18 to 45, um, mental health, whatever podcast. And then they're actually listening to my podcast and being like, "Ooh, I don't know if I want to be associated with that. I hope that's not the case, but I'm afraid that it might be. So anyway, those are my two fan mails. Thank you for sticking with us. Thank you for sticking with me. And thank you for sticking with this community. Let's get into the episode and talk about more undiagnosed autistic kid traits. Okay, so the first trait, or it would be actually the fifth trait, because go back if you haven't listened to the episode prior to this, it outlines the first four traits. And the fifth one is or statements. They're more like statements you hear from people if you're an undiagnosed autistic kid. You need to get out more and talk to people. Stop playing with X so much. And X could be anything, whatever you're playing a lot with. I don't think that's a person because for me, it was definitely not a person. You know what this makes me think of? And this was absolutely me. And it says you need to get out more and stuff. So I feel like this isn't something you get told when you're like six, seven, eight, nine, right? Like you can't get out more. You're supposed to be in, you know, in your own home. When I was mm, 16, 17, maybe, I, you know, I had a lot of, I won't say friends. They probably saw as me as friends, but we didn't hang out. A lot of friends and acquaintances from school. And they would go out all the time together, I guess. They were, in England, you can, um, well, actually the drinking age is 18, but you know, at 16, 17, you're copping a beer here and there. You might be able to fob your way into some place, but you're going out, you're partying, you're going to under 18 clubs, you're going here, you're going there. You're just hanging out a lot with people. And I wasn't really doing that. I probably had one or two people, uh, that I would hang out with and wasn't drinking at that time. And so my major thing that used to drive my mom insane is on, I forget the channel it was on in the UK, but when I was around 16 or 17, so this will be early 2000s, we're talking like 2001, 2, 3, Charmed, the TV show, used to play all day on this certain channel. 
I'm talking like 9 to 6, like 9 a.m. to 6 p.m. It would just be back to back episodes of Charmed, like Monday through Friday. And that's what I would do. I would sit in front of the TV, maybe on my laptop doing other things, not on my cell phone because they didn't have smartphones back then. And, you know, keeping in touch with friends, looking on the internet, writing things, whatever, being creative, maybe doing some art. But I would be in front of the TV watching Charmed eight hours a day, all day, every day. And it drove my mom insane. And the boyfriend she had at the time, he had a child that was like two years younger than me. So maybe like 14 to 16. And I was like 16 to 18. And he was out and about all the time with his friends. So my mom's boyfriend didn't get it. He was like, does she not have friends? Like, what is going on? And it would drive my mom insane. If any of you guys know the Charmed TV show, with the original intro music, because now they don't have the rights to it. And if you watch it online, they've changed the intro music. But it was from that British band. I can't remember off the top of my head, but it's the I am the sun. I am the air. I am human and I need to be loved. That one. Um, And it starts off. That intro moment where it would go. It drove my mom insane. She'd be like, if I have to hear that music one more time, and I would just sit in the living room, just watching it all the time. And it's the funny thing is, I had a TV in my bedroom, but I didn't want to watch it in my bedroom. Or actually at the time, that time, I didn't, we'd moved to another uh, flat. We, It's a whole big thing, but we lived in council housing. It was bought by a housing association. They moved us to another flat just like down the street. And so I didn't have uh, a TV in my room at that time, but I had my laptop. But I didn't want to watch it in my room because of the like ADHD mirroring thing. Is it called mirroring? You know, the thing where uh, you want someone in the room with you at the same time while you're doing something. They don't have to be doing the same thing. They don't have to be talking to you. It's even best if they don't. They can just ignore you. But they need to be in the room. And so I like to watch it out in the living room, in the big comfy chair, and just play it. Oh, I guess also on my laptop, I couldn't access this TV channel, right? This was also a different time, a different time, like, oh God, 20 years ago, guys, guys, 20 years ago, where you couldn't just log in to the channel on your laptop and be like, oh, I already pay for this, or I'm a local person, like, let me log in. You had to watch it on the TV. And I wasn't going to DVR it because I'm not going to like record it to watch like eight hours of it at nighttime when my mom's asleep or whatever. So I did that constantly. And it was always like from my mom, my boyfriend, uh, my boyfriend, my mom's boyfriend, less from my mom. My mom more was like, that's what she wants to do. And my grandfather would be like, is she okay? Like she doesn't do anything. She doesn't go anywhere. She should be going out with her friends. And I was like, leave me alone. Like leave me alone. This is what I want to do. And I really enjoy it. And this is where I get my joy from. Like, leave me alone. So that's one specifically that I can think of. I'm wondering if you listening are thinking of something specifically that someone would say, you need to get out and about. Why do you do, why do you just, you know, hang out or do this all the time? So think about that and, uh, try and pinpoint those moments where maybe your neurodivergency was had a real big hold of you. Not that it's a bad thing, but maybe there would have been times that I should have said, you know, when a friend from school said, hey, do you want to come out tonight? Instead of saying no, because I was anxious, socially anxious, afraid of leaving my comfort zone, wondering what I'd have to eat, drink, wear, blah, 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 all the anxiety. Maybe I should have just gone out on a limb, you know, once or twice to just be like, yeah, I am going to do that. But man, I love those Charmed episodes. All right. And now the sixth um, statement made about undiagnosed autistic kids. And actually, this is not going to be so relevant to me because I grew up in the UK. The statement is, why do you always wear that? Don't you have other clothes? And this is so interesting to me because I grew up in the UK. We grew up with a uniform. Okay. So I'll go over my high school uniform just because that's easy and the one I can remember the most. In the fall and winter, or autumn winter, 
you could wear a gray pleated skirt, like down to your knee, or a gray pair of dress pants. Then you would wear a white button-up shirt, like buttoned up, collared to your throat, like a man who's in a business suit. Then a tie, fully tied like a normal tie, choking you. You could wear a v-neck sweater over the top if you were chilly, and then you'd wear a blazer over the top. So you basically looked like a man in a suit, you know? And that's what you wore fall and winter. So I had one blazer. I think I had two at one point, but mostly one because it's like a jacket. You don't sweat into it. I had maybe three dress white shirts, a couple of ties. I had one v-neck sweater and I had a gray skirt and a gray pair of pants. So if I was dressing up, the top was the same. Either I wear the sweater or not. And then I wear either the skirt or the pants. So there wasn't much to go into it, right? I wore the same thing all the time and everyone else did. So no one's going to say, hey, where? why are you wearing that uniform again? And then in the summer, and this was actually a new thing for our school, I think it was becoming more common, is that you could wear a polo shirt. It was a navy blue polo shirt with the school's logo on it. And you had to get it from a certain store in town that they went through and had the logo already embroidered on it. But you wore that with usually a skirt because it was summer, but you you wore the same thing every day. That was very normal. And I've always loved work with uniforms. Always. I worked for a nonprofit. We had to wear scrubs. Loved it. I worked in retail, had to wear a uniform. Absolutely loved it. And now for work, I am hybrid work. So I only have to go in max three times a week. I get to work from home two days a week. If I have PTO, it's less than that, you know, all that kind of stuff. So it's been really nice because I don't have to come up with five outfits every week. But let me tell you, I have the same three outfits that I wear every single week. I mix up which days I wear them, but I wear exactly the same outfits three times a week, a different one each of the three days. And I'll tell you, I got a couple of new shirts. I was just like, I need to mix it up. Let me get some new shirts. I got two new shirts and I went into work the other day with one of these new shirts on. And immediately one of my friends and coworkers said, did you get a new shirt? And in my head, I'm going, okay, so maybe they've noticed I wear the same thing every day. Maybe they've noticed, but I don't care. Like, I really don't care. I, it's so much easier for me if I just pick my own uniform. Like I wear this outfit one day, that outfit another day, that, and it's the same rotation all, like every week. I will say I run through clothes pretty quickly because I'll be wearing the same pants every week. Do you notice that? Like if you wear a shirt, the set, like three, two or three times a week, every week or whatever, and you wash it a lot, it gets uh, holes in it, it gets bobbly, the color washes out, things like that. So I'm kind of going through these clothes fast, which is why I bought these two extra shirts. I'd notice holes in the armpits of uh, one of the shirts I would wear to work like every week. So I had to do something about that. I didn't really have that many issues as a kid. Um, We didn't have a lot of money. So I remember being in high school looking in my closet. And because you don't have to wear your own, you aren't allowed to wear your own clothes to school. I think I had like a couple of pairs of jeans, a couple of skirts, and like five shirts, you know, and some sweaters. Like that's all I had because you only wore those on the weekend. You would co- I would come home, you know, and immediately get into my gym jams when I got out of school. I wasn't coming home getting on my outfit and going out with my friends. That's not what was happening. So I didn't need that many clothes anyway. But I do remember my mom commenting that I wore, I would wear like the same combat pants. There was a military store in my hometown. And oh my God, I would just buy, I had like blue, like kind of dusty blue combat pants. I had green, um, like uh, cargo green combat pants. I really loved All Saints at that age and that vibe was basically like baggy combat pants and a tighter top and then I would wear like a long sleeve top with a like a scoot neck or boat neck where you not a scoot neck like a boat neck or a crew neck I guess basically where you couldn't see my boobs and I was called back then a tomboy which nowadays they might say you dress kind of androgynous or non-binary I'm not trans I'm not non-binary I die 
I identify as a woman, even though I wear very short hair that I shave up the back, which I've done for a very long time, for decades. And I prefer pants, but I don't identify that way. But that's maybe what would have come up back then. But back then it was you're a tomboy because I only like to wear pants. I didn't start wearing skirts again until I was like 14 or 15. I only wore pants in school from about the age of like 10 to 14. And then even outside, it was kind of a weird experiment or whatever. But it was definitely a topic of conversation that my choice in clothing was always the same and in a certain direction. But yeah, because I had um, a uniform at school, it wasn't, I can't imagine, God, I I just want to say for Americans who maybe think this is strange, here's what I will say that it does, it equalizes you. As horrible it is, as it is for some people to have to wear a uniform, and I loved it, it equalizes you, right? You all have to buy the same blazer at a certain cost that's not too expensive at the same store in town. So... You can't say like, oh, well, that's the Adidas um, uh, shoes, but this person's wearing the shoes from Dollar Tree with four stripes on, ew, because that would happen sometimes during like PE class, right? And I cannot imagine how that is in America in a school where I know you'll have certain parameters, like you can't wear, you know, boobs out like, skirt up your butt, like, I don't know, are men allowed to have, are the boys, boys, men, whatever, allowed to have, like, cut-off sleeves? I really don't know, but I know there can be parameters around stuff. But if I had to go every day to school in an, in an outfit, and there's other people, and you've got the people who are like, oh, my mom took me shopping this weekend again, you know, to get my new, and then other people are in hand-me-downs from their older siblings, some people are in secondhand clothing because their parents just can't afford it. So it's really an equalizer that helps to eliminate a lot of the bullying from you uh, competing with your clothing, with brands and things of that nature. Because even down to the shoes, like we could, you know, you're not supposed to wear sneakers to school, like I just said about the Adidas and then the Dollar Tree shoes, but people would and you'd still get ripped. You'd get ripped apart if you were wearing, I'll give an example in America, which I know. And in England too, New Balance. New Balance now is like cool because it became the chunky dad sneaker and New Balance leaned into it. Well, I'm telling you right now, New Balance was never cool. New Balance, you'd be made fun of. If you're not wearing Nike or Nike or Adidas, in England, you could wear Reebok, Puma. Those are not really brands that kind of fly in America. But if you were in like New Balance, if you were in Kappa, um, that was called Crappy Kappa when I was growing up. If you were in an unbranded sneaker, oh my god, some idiot is just gonna tear you apart all day and just make your life a living hell. So definitely a different experience to me, for me, than I think it would be for like an American teen or child. Then the seventh one statement is stop doing that. It's really annoying. Why are you always doing that? I'm trying to think what this might pertain to maybe um repetitive behavior maybe things like stimming where you're bouncing your knee you're you know mushing your hands you're pulling your fingers you're twirling your hair you're biting i mean for me biting my fingers biting my fingernails biting my lip skin i will say that tangent sorry off here I recently just started, like two weeks ago or a week ago, I put on fake nails again. I had to do a two-day training at work. I wanted to seem cool. I got out my fake Louis Vuitton bag and put on my fake nails. Well, let me tell you, which this always was a thing, that I, but I'm realizing it again. When I put on fake nails, I bite my fingers less. And I think it's because it's harder <laughs> to bite them. Because you have a fake nail on there, the bed is harder to access and the skin around it. And then also, because you appreciate your nails, you just want them to look good. And so actually my nail beds and my finger skin around my nails has really, really improved. So if you're looking to try and combat that, super recommend putting on some fake nails. I will say the first day or so, they literally feel like you have a couple of carrots. Like you have like a carrot on each finger. They feel a bit alien. It's hard to pick things up. And I don't have long nails. I have just the oval you know, very short, normal, stubby nails. 
but still they feel a bit foreign. You can feel the glue. And after a couple of days, it really just bonds and you can't even feel them anymore. anymore. And depending on how you look after them, they last for two or three weeks. So just a tip from me there. But yeah, I'm wondering what that is referencing, the things you keep doing and stop doing that. I'm thinking repetitive behavior, things of that nature. I'm thinking obsessive behavior. So not things to do with your body, but like um, like maybe watching the charmed thing over and over again. Why do you keep doing that? This cannot be enjoyable. You've seen this episode a million times, you know. This cannot be enjoyable. For example, I've spoken about the tuna melt, the best tuna melt, the tuna melt at the place where they messed up the bread that one week and I thought I'd almost died and now the bread's back. I want to go there every week. Every Saturday or Sunday, just once a week, that's where I want to go. We didn't go this weekend and it was fine. I lived. We lived. But I really like that and I can tell my husband's like, again, (laughs) again you want to go again? And I'm like, it's been seven days, sir. It's been seven days. Like, I'm I'm ready for that tuna melt. So definitely get side eyes. I started watching Six Feet Under. Again, I'm just wanting to live the dream that is the dream. And I never saw the final season, though I've heard about it. And I watched it when it first came out. So when it first came out, 2001, I was 15 years old. It was transformative for me. I started watching it and I'm watching multiple episodes a day and my husband's like, have you not seen this before? And I was like, yes, and, but also I said to him, look, and he got perspective after this. I was like, look, it's 2024. It came out in 2001. It only went to like 2006. It has been more than 20 years since I have seen this show. That put it into perspective. Like 2001 is 23 years ago. I have not seen this show since it came out. And then I, like I said, I abandoned the last season because I uh, moved to America and I just had a lot of stuff going on. We didn't have access to TVs and things like that. So, you know, going to school and everything and hanging out with people. But it's been 23 years since I've seen this show. So to me, that does not seem like a lot. I think maybe I've spoken about it a bit, but my husband's just like, you've seen this already. I'm like, yeah. And you've seen Howl's Moving Castle a bunch. You've seen Cowboy Bebop a bunch. I can watch it again. So, yeah, definitely an experience for me. And I think the reason why why I'm talking about being more of a teenager is because it's what I remember. I'm estranged from my family, who I grew up with, and so kind of talking about when I was six or seven, eight, nine, ten, if I don't remember it, I don't have anyone to go to to ask or clarify, right? I don't have anyone to go to and say, hey, am I remembering this right? Or... Can you think of some times where I A, B, C? So I'm just pulling on the times where I really recognize that behavior or experience. Then we have the eighth and final statement. Just hug him. He's your grandpa. I don't care if you barely know him. Why are you being so weird about it? Oh my God. And I know I just said I'm only thinking of when I was older, but I have a very distinctive memory. Very of maybe being, I want to say, between the age of six and eight. Again, I don't have anyone to ask, so I can't remember exactly when. I have a cousin who um, was younger than my mom. My mom was only 19 years older than me, and he was probably five, three to five years younger than her. So he was only, you know, a bit more than a decade older, older than me. So when I was a young child, he was in his early 20s. And he helped to raise me. He was a father figure. He's a very sensitive boy. He was an absolute sweetheart and really showed me what unconditional love and sensitivity was. He would pick me up from school. He would take me, you know, to the park and all this kind of stuff. And I remember being in my grandparents' back garden because they had a council house, but they had a little yard in the back. And which I didn't growing up, that was my yard, was their yard when we would go visit. And we were, we used to live there oftentimes for like weeks at a time because we didn't have enough money to keep the lights on at our own home. But we were in the back garden and I, I think everyone was there and everyone is in maybe my cousins, my mom, my grandmother, my grandfather. I was sitting on my cousin's lap. So he's a man in his early 20s. And I'm six to eight years old, mid to, well, not early 20s. If I was six, 
he was, yeah, maybe early 20s. If I was like eight, mid 20s, hard to say. I think once I became like a little tween, he was like 28, 29. And I was sitting on his lap. And my grandfather was on a chair opposite us, I think smoking a cigarette, classic granddad. And my cousin, who was such a sweetheart, was like, you need to hug your grandfather more. You need to hug your granddad. You need, and try to like force me into the lap of my grandfather, who was across from me. And not for, but like be like, put me on and be like, come on, hug your granddad. And my granddad was like, no, 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 get her away from me. No, no, no. And so I was like, okay. And that was always my, my relationship with my grandfather, who's very standoffish. Um, my, he worked nights, so he would sleep during the day. And one time my mom and grandmother tried to leave me alone. Well, they did leave me alone with him during the day while he was asleep upstairs. They went to go shopping on like a Saturday. And I screamed and cried at the window because I didn't want to be left alone with this man because I just didn't know him. And so that was classic him. Don't touch me. Get her away from me. I don't hug people. I don't love these kids. I'm not very nice to them. They kind of just exist, right? And now, looking back, I think my grandfather was neurodivergent, if not autistic. I think about all the times, like once I became an older teenager and like 20, 21, and my boyfriend, who's now my husband, came to visit from America. And me, my grandmother, and my mom, and her boyfriend, and us went out to a restaurant. We went out to a carvery. We got dinner. My grandfather refused to come. And he would also say to my mom, you know, why do you have people over at your house? That's weird. And I think he had this real locked down sense of social anxiety. He didn't want to be out there talking to new people. He wasn't a social butterfly. He didn't want people in his space that he didn't know. And that screams autism to me. It scurs reams it. And so I'm wondering if that's what that was. He didn't want to be touched. He didn't want to hug, you know. And so I've always had that too. Why don't you, you know, hug this person more? Why don't you hug him? You barely know him. I don't care. It's like, well, yeah, I barely know my grandfather. I'm not going to hug someone I barely freaking know. And I think he barely knew me. And so it was very strange. And that's probably the one memory I have in this whole thing that's of a younger time that sticks with me because I didn't want to be forced upon him. He clearly didn't want me. And maybe I wanted him to want me, you know, but it was a strange relationship because he worked nights all the time when I was growing up. So we almost never saw him. So that's the end of the undiagnosed autistic statements. If you're an autistic, if you were an undiagnosed, autistic kid sorry i just burped right there um if you're an undiagnosed autistic kid these are probably some statements you would have heard please listen back to the last episode if you haven't already because that gives the first four and now you've got these four i'm hoping to do another doggy episode and honestly i don't know if it'll be tomorrow but whenever it is i'll just throw it up there i I'm, the schedule is kablooey right now and then hopefully i will see you again next week Thank you much. Thank you. Thank you much. Good Lord, guys. What is happening? Thank you so much for sticking with me. I love you all. Please leave me a review on Apple. Hit the five star on Spotify. Thank you so much. Your energy, your fan mail, your messages, seeing how many people are still listening is what is keeping me going through all of this work stuff, my dog having chemo, and just trying to live freaking life. Um, maybe you'll hear about a hurricane next week. Hopefully not. Love you guys. I'll see you again soon for season four of My Brain is a Wonderland. Bye-bye.